everybody. I'm Sue, Sue Parker Hall, and I'm a recovering radical feminist. <laughs> Welcome to my presentation, Male Shame, How Psychotherapy May Be to Blame and Could Improve Its Aim. <laughs> I'm really honoured and delighted to be speaking at this conference. It's a conference that's very close to my heart. I'm a psychotherapist and author of a book entitled Anger, Rage and Relationship, an empathic approach to anger management. It's a non-gendered approach because I believe that anger and rage issues are not a gender issue, but are a human issue. So now I just want to let you know why I'm so committed to men's issues. It's because I was a social sciences student in the 1980s and I was indoctrinated with Marxism and radical feminism. As a consequence of this, for the 15 years afterwards, my relationship with my partner and with every other male I came into contact with was not good. For those 15 years, I believed men were toxic, but actually it was me who was toxic. I believed I was superior and that my partner and other males that I came into contact with were inferior that they were in need of my correction, in need of my constructive criticism, in need of my advice. <laughs> For obvious reasons, my relationships with men were destructive. They were painful for them and for me. I realise now that while studying my degree, I was easy to indoctrinate because I felt a lot of shame. Under the influence of radical feminist ideology, I felt artificially powerful and confident, whilst all the while lurking below that thin veneer was a profound sense of not being good enough, a profound sense of not being okay. Through adopting a radical feminist stance towards men, I could project my shame, I could displace it onto my partner, and others. They became a scapegoat, which kept my fragile sense of self intact, all the while demolishing theirs. This is all very personal information, but I have a few reasons for sharing it with you. Firstly, it's the answer to the perennial question I'm always asked, why are you so interested in men's issues and men's rights? Secondly, what I shared with you explains how a great deal of shame that men feel is because they're a convenient scapegoat for others' shame and not just women's shame, but for other men's shame as well. And lastly, I find splitting and polarisation very disturbing. I felt particularly disturbed by the so-called battle of the sexes. I can't abide that good, bad split the one up, one down dynamic. These days I only feel good when I'm feeling I'm okay and you're okay in my relationships. So now I'm going to tell you about the contents of this presentation. I'm going to tell you about the kind of issues that my male clients present with. I'll define the terms I'll be using of masculinity, trauma, shame and rage. And we'll be looking at the causes of shame focusing on one cause in particular, that of misandry. I'll introduce you to my model of self that guides my work with men and discuss what psychotherapists and counsellors may be doing that's unhelpful and how, as the presentation title suggests, they may improve their aim. These are the issues that the men I'm honoured to work with present. Rage behaviours. False allegations. That could be about intimate partner violence, sexual violence or child sexual abuse. Feeling suicidal and possibly having made an attempt at suicide. This is rare, however, because men are more often successful in completing their suicides. They may be having fathering issues with their blood children, but more often with stepchildren. They may be experiencing a lack of contact with their children significantly reduced contact or no contact at all. They come with relationship difficulties and relationship breakdown. They're often not looking after themselves in their relationships 
not attending to their own needs and allowing themselves to be poorly treated. Certain feelings can bring men into therapy, such as experiencing a lack of control, anger, anxieties, fears or depression. They may be unsure of their sexuality, may have issues in their sexual relationship, could be feeling overwhelmed, powerless and experiencing grief and loss. I just want to share with you now the issue that men most regularly present with. I have to say that I work with just as many women who present with this same issue. Brené Brown, a psychologist and shame expert, talks about how when perfectionism is driving, shame is always riding shotgun. I would say when rage is driving, shame is always riding shotgun. But also when shame is driving, rage is always riding shotgun. Rage and shame are inseparable, like a horse and carriage. You can't have one without the other. You'll notice that trauma is at the heart of this cycle. Rage and shame are trauma responses, and trauma responses are unconscious. In other words, we have absolutely no conscious control over them. And in my opinion, it's an abuse of a person who suffers with these issues if we treat them as if they did have conscious control over them. I'm not saying that a person doesn't have to take responsibility for their behaviour. Of course they do. All I'm saying is, I've worked with hundreds of people for thousands of hours who present with these issues, and in my experience, any improvement can't be sustained through using symptom management or control type strategies. Willpower alone simply doesn't hold up under stressful situations. When we white knuckle it, every cell of our body is poised to capitulate, to surrender to the behaviour we sincerely want to avoid. As we'll see, a more helpful and long lasting intervention will emerge from focusing not on the trauma behaviour, but on the life events and experiences which have caused the trauma symptoms of rage and shame in the first place. Research has found that endorphins are released when we experience rage. As you probably will already know, endorphins make us feel good. They have an analgesic or anaesthetic effect. They provide insensitivity to pain. This is why they're addictive. So looking at the model, whichever comes first for the traumatised individual, whether shame leads to rage or rage leads to shame, endorphins are cushioned between the rage and the shame. They intervene, albeit briefly, to alleviate the pain. When the endorphins are activated, the distress very temporarily goes away. There's some brief relief, some brief respite. For someone who doesn't know how to manage overwhelming experience, this cycle can be very addictive. However dramatic this cycle may seem, it's actually very passive in terms of solving problems and difficulties, it consistently re-traumatises the individual and those around them. It seriously damages relationships with self and others and may land you in court, prison or hospital with an injury or a heart attack. In the past, when I have offered an empathic explanation of rage as a trauma response, beyond the conscious control of the individual, I've been accused of being an apologist for bad behaviour. So just to be clear, my empathic explanation does not excuse or defend rage behaviour. Whilst an individual does not have conscious control over their rage symptoms, they absolutely do have conscious control over and a responsibility for getting help with them. Such behaviour is not okay. It harms self and others and is indeed criminal in cases. So now let's look at some definitions of the terms I'll be using. Firstly, masculinity, which I define as a set of attributes, behaviours and roles associated with boys and men, including traits of stoicness, strength, honour, courage, independence, leadership and assertiveness. I'm very unhappy about the way that traditional masculinity traits have been made bad, called toxic or harmful. It's been especially sad and angering to me 
that the American Psychological Association and some of my colleagues have been seduced into believing that traditional masculinity needs to be addressed, mitigated, reconstituted or deconstructed. I would like traditional masculinity to be more widely accepted, encouraged even, as one possible OK masculine identity amongst other OK masculine identities. I think it can be really helpful for men to have a balance of alpha and beta traits which equip them to engage in the variety of roles that society expects from them, in the roles Martin Seeger, psychologist, has identified as fighter and winner, provider and protector of women, children and others, which I believe includes nurturing, and to exercise mastery and control. Seeger tells us that men can experience a good deal of shame if they fail to live up to these roles. And now let's define trauma. Trauma by its nature cannot be anticipated. We're unselfconsciously going about our business and then bam, it strikes. It's unexpected, so we have no defence against it. It shocks our body and our mind. Its impact lodges in our body and our mind. I define trauma as an untold story, an emotional and physiological response to life experience whether of epic or apparently trivial proportions, which has not yet been processed or integrated. In other words, a life event or life events which we've not yet come to terms with. Trauma can be caused in two distinct ways. One is that as a child, important needs were not met, which affects a person's security and stability in the world. The other cause of trauma is experiencing adverse life events. My clients typically present with both. Pierre Janet, as long ago as 1907, partly defines trauma as there was nobody there. I've qualified that by saying there was literally nobody there, or there was nobody there who wasn't traumatised themselves, or there was nobody there who wasn't being abusive or neglectful. So let's define shame now. Shame is a direct result of exposure to trauma. Because trauma is so unexpected, we are porous. We are unprotected when it strikes. We can't defend ourselves. As the event happens, there's no separation between me and the traumatic event, or what I call the hostile environment. We can feel punished by the adverse incident, and it's quite common for the first response to a trauma to be what did I do wrong? I must have done something wrong. It's as if I become imprinted with the bad environment. There's confusion. I mistake my feeling bad because of what has happened with my being bad. So a bad event becomes I am bad. And this sense of badness can go on for decades unless someone can help me extricate myself from the bad event unless someone can help me see that something bad happened to me, that doesn't mean I'm bad. And here's my definition of shame in progress. An involuntary, unconscious phenomenon, an emotionally and sometimes physically painful affective state caused by the initial impact of any kind of preconception, prenatal or postnatal trauma. It ruptures the relationship with self with others and the wider environment. There are many possible sources of shame, as my definition implies. But within a therapy context, when I'm working with people generally, I need to be trauma aware, alert to the developmental trauma that may have occurred and to the adverse life events that may have occurred. But when I'm working with men, I need to acknowledge a very particular bad environment that they experience on a daily basis, one that hardly anyone notices, because, I would argue, of the influence of radical feminism which has blinded us to it. That bad environment is misandry, defined as the dislike of, contempt for or ingrained prejudice against men what I describe as a shadowy cloud of negative regard for men that hangs there 
operating as invisibly as the air that we breathe or the water that we drink. There's a good deal of dislike of, contempt for or ingrained prejudice against men in our society. Remember the Gillette advert in 2019 that negatively stereotyped men, respectable men at that, men who were cooking for their family and friends. The advert depicted a series of very ugly and negative behaviours, including bullying, sexual harassment and the interruption of a woman speaking in the workplace. It also framed healthy boy behaviours, such as roughhousing and running about, as toxic. Rather like the frog who's placed in cold water and then heated up, men I have worked with often don't realise they're miserable, often don't realise they're suffering. In my experience, many of the men who I've been honoured to work with have normalised their pain. They would say something like, well, that's just what being a man is like, or you have to expect that if you're a man. This is the shadow side of men's stoicness, a tendency and willingness to suffer too much for too long. In many cases, I see no expectation of happiness, no sense of entitlement to happiness, and this normalising of pain continues as it started, one drip at a time, one degree Fahrenheit at a time, until it's too late. A boiling point is reached, the man reaches and exceeds the limit of his pain, and rage and or shame, or worse, suicide are the result. There are way too many men who are suiciding. The death of one man or one woman by suicide is a tragedy, but many more men are quite simply living miserably, a hair's breadth inside their limit of pain tolerance, normalising it and stoically living with it, often only seeking help if a partner or family member or friend suggest it. I mentioned that one of the sources of trauma that can lead to shame and rage is developmental trauma. I just want to include now some of the work of Alan Shaw, who's particularly researched the early psychological needs of boys and what might impair their healthy psychological development. In his article entitled All Our Sons, The Developmental Neurobiology and Neuroendocrinology of Boys at Risk, he identifies potential causes of trauma in infant boys, which I believe can lead to shame and rage. Shaw describes a variety of ways in which baby boys' needs may be overlooked, ways in which they may not receive the nurture they need for healthy psychological development. Boys mature slower, physically, socially and linguistically, than girls and their stress-regulating brain circuitries mature more slowly too, prenatally, perinatally and postnatally. Boys are affected more negatively than girls by early environmental stress, inside and outside the womb. And they're also more vulnerable to maternal stress and depression in the womb, birth trauma and unresponsive caregiving. All these things combine to significantly impact the development of a boy's right brain hemisphere, which undermines the development of self-regulatory brain circuitry related to his self-control and his capacity to relate to others. Normal term newborn boys show higher cortisol levels than girls during their neonatal behaviour assessment. This can result in them developing behaviour problems and stress-related diseases later in life. At six months, boys show more frustration than girls, and at 12 months, a greater reaction to negative stimuli. Daycare may be less adequate for baby boys, and all these factors combined make boys more prone to developmental psychiatric disorders, autism, early onset schizophrenia, ADHD and conduct disorders, all of which I would say are characterised by the trauma defence mechanisms of shame and rage. Now, let's take aim and see what men may need. As I said earlier, in my experience, I've never found it that helpful to focus on trauma behaviour in therapy. It's more helpful, I've found, 
to focus on what may have caused the trauma symptoms in the first place. The way I facilitate this is to think of ourselves as a pot where all the events which have impacted on us but have not yet been properly addressed are stored. The therapy I facilitate involves telling these untold stories in an environment that maximises trauma processing and healing. This is Jack's pot. These are the stories that it was helpful for him to tell one at a time. The separating out of them, our untold stories are all bound up together until we purposefully separate them out, and the relating of them to another who embodies the qualities that we'll look at now can enable developmental processes to occur which have been missed, as well as reducing stress and opening up space within the organism. The antidote to a bad environment is a good environment, one that offers particular conditions the overriding important factor being a positive attitude to masculinity, including traditional masculinity. The therapeutic relationship is the good environment. It's co-created and helps the male client to create inner stability and heal their shame and rage. But before we look more at the environment, let's look at the therapy process. There are three elements involved in experiencing and integrating life's events. They are thinking, meaning making or making sense of, behaving, in this case telling the stories, feeling, experiencing and processing the emotional content of an experience that could not be felt at the time that the trauma occurred. Deborah Dana, who's an expert in applying polyvagal theory to therapy practice, tells us that a stressed autonomic nervous system welcomes the truth and she speaks of the need to find the right repair, the words that mend the tear. And what I would say is, when stories are told from beginning to end, in a joined up way, and in words that accurately express the experience, trauma is healed, rage and shame dissolve, and the organism feels okay. Okay as in regulated and settled. Let's look at the Venn diagram again. The circles represented here show the elements neatly and equally overlapping, but this is unlikely to happen in practice. These circles will overlap in different proportions for every client. It's very likely that one of the elements will be less natural and therefore less useful and will not feature much in the therapy process. While everyone I work with will be telling their stories, some will gain more benefit through making meaning of what's happened to them, Others will gain more benefit from feeling their way through, from an emotional release. And for some, more benefit will be gained through a combination of all of them. Let's look now at the qualities that need to be present in the therapeutic environment if men are to feel okay enough about themselves and the therapist to do their psychological work. This model expresses that when a person feels okay, their body knows exactly what it needs to do at any moment to heal itself and will naturally do that. The main focus for therapists working in this way is firstly to maintain an optimal environment where the client feels okay and secondly to trust in the client's own healing process. So here we are. You can see the client feeling okay at his core and his life experience integrating zone is lively. Let's unpack the environment. Of course, in any therapy, we'd expect respect for the client to be at the top of any list. But I just wanted to flesh this quality out a bit more. Along with the respect for the humanity of our male client, there needs to be a respect for traditional masculinity, for the inevitable strengths that he'll have. Very importantly, respect for his version of events. So many male clients that I've worked with have not had their version of events believed. Often their story has been trumped by that of another person or agency. It's important to respect a male client's preference for which of the elements, thinking, feeling and behaving, that he uses to integrate his experience. And lastly, I think there needs to be a healthy respect for aggression, 
I'll return to this in the next slide. So we've looked at respect and now we'll look at placing our attention exclusively on the client, letting the client lead the content, lead the pace, offering warmth, offering validation in terms of recognition that a person or their feelings or their opinions are valid or worthwhile. We need to normalise trauma, rage, shame, symptoms. Be curious and interested. Affirm our clients in terms of emotional support or encouragement. Offer kindness, humour, empathy in terms of the ability or attempt at least to understand and share the feelings of another person and to handle vulnerability gently if and when it does emerge. And now we return to aggression. It may sound controversial because of the assumption that it's associated with violence, but I think it's particularly important when working with men to welcome their aggression. So I'm going to say more about it here. I looked up definitions of violence and aggression in the Merriam-Webster dictionary. To my surprise, what I found were two remarkably similar and negative characterisations. Violence was defined as the use of physical force so as to injure, abuse, damage or destroy. And aggression was defined as forceful action, attacks and hostile, injurious or destructive behaviour. So in the dictionary, and also I would argue within the discipline of psychology, aggression is perceived as a hostile process, overlapping significantly with the definition of violence. I'm going to differentiate between aggression and violence and acknowledge the evolutionary and existential necessity of aggression, thereby placing it in a more positive light. I'll begin by sharing Fritz and Laura Pearl's definition with you and then I'll share my own. Aggression is a biological function and an instrument that enables the very preservation of life and which regulates our contact with the environment. And now my understanding of aggression. It is indeed a force, but a force for good. Quite simply, I see it as the energy that powers our penetration of the world, the energy through which we make our unique presence felt, the energy that powers our assertiveness, our curiosity. It fuels our exploration of the world and our appetite for learning and mastery of things. Overall, I see aggression as a means to tackle things, to attain goals for ourselves and chase our dreams, and also to support others to achieve their goals and chase their dreams. Aggression is a means to protect ourselves and those we're responsible for, but it is bounded, executed with care and respect, and it doesn't harm or belittle another person. If we're not allowed a healthy aggression, it's my belief that we can't show up safely and fully in the world, can't have an impact on the world, can't build a meaningful life for ourselves and can't fully manifest our unique contribution in the world. Many of the men I work with have never been allowed their aggression or they've been conditioned out of it. They can be passive, too appeasing, pleasing or accommodating which then gives rise to shame and rage. Men are helped to recover or discover their latent aggression, to experience all the benefits of that, which will also benefit the other people in his life. Finally, I include an analysis of how counsellors and psychotherapists may be to blame and could improve their aim. Here are a few therapist practices that could undermine a positive outcome in psychotherapy for a male client. If the therapist were to hold a negative attitude towards traditional masculinity, if they didn't understand all the ways in which men go unacknowledged for their contribution to the world, are taken for granted, or that they experience many social disadvantages, if they don't take the time to build relationship and trust, if they overestimate a man's strength or underestimate his vulnerability. If they make problem behaviour the focus of the work rather than the underlying issues. It's never okay to rush a client along, 
but bearing in mind Alan Shaw's research, it's especially not OK to rush a male client. It's important for them to set the pace. It's a mistake to overemphasize the emotional component of the integrating process. It's not helpful if a therapist doesn't understand that, for a man, taking action or thinking things through may be more important than expressing emotion. I believe that some therapists lament, in the opposite way to Rex Harrison in the film My Fair Lady, why can't a man be more like a woman, thinking that then they'd be OK. It's not helpful if the therapist lacks an empathic understanding of shame and rage as trauma behaviours, or to think that men are in need of reconstruction, reprogramming, or any other form of social engineering. Or if they don't understand that shame may come from many sources, so having too narrow a focus, i.e. just comes from parents or caregivers. In conclusion, firstly, I want to say that rage and shame behaviours have nothing to do with natural masculinity. They are human responses to trauma, experienced by everyone, and they say nothing about masculinity, per se. Secondly, I want to say that as therapists, we do men a great disservice if we're not aware of, or turn a blind eye to, either the misandry that's embedded in our culture, or to the many social disadvantages that they experience. I refer you to a book which you're certain to be aware of, written by William Collins, a prolific researcher and presenter at this conference, entitled The Empathy Gap, Male Disadvantages and the Mechanisms of Their Neglect, and his website, The Empathy Gap. The penultimate point I'd like to make is that, of course, the psychotherapy work I do does not suit every man, just as it does not suit every woman. And also, some of the men I've been blessed to work with go on to complete their work with a male psychotherapist, which I'm really pleased about. A male friend of mine told me, I think a female psychotherapist can help a man to process his psychological injuries up to and including adolescence, but then he needs a male therapist to nurture his adult male self. That makes sense to me. I'm happy with that. Lastly, I'm very grateful that as I began to recover from my 15 years of indoctrination, I was able to apologise to my long-suffering partner and he very gallantly and kindly accepted my apology. I sincerely hope that the work I'm doing goes some way to making amends for my past failure to hold men in high regard. I'd like to draw your attention to my podcast, provocatively entitled Man Made. Please subscribe and share if you like it. The subjects of my episodes so far have been testosterone, male suicide, getting rid of the negative male stereotype, that's based on Martin Seeger's work, male shame, and one entitled Swastikas, Penises and Donald Trump. <laughs> and on that note, thank you so much for joining me and accompanying me to the end.